Welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. In April, the Sudanese people overthrew their longtime dictator, President Omar al-Bashir. Tens of thousands of people have taken to the streets of Khartoum this past week demanding change. But the revolution wasn't finished. Last month, Sudan formed a government that shares power between a civilian-led administration under new Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok and a so-called Sovereign Council, chaired by the military. Today, I'm super pleased to have Reem Abbas join us from Khartoum to discuss where things stand now. Reem is a journalist, activist, and researcher. Just a note, we recorded this on October 9th, so please keep that in mind as you listen. Hi, Reem. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's really a pleasure. So Sudan formed its new government in early September. Uh, How is the new power-sharing government holding up so far? The power sharing um, government, I would say until now, uh, people are very cautious. Uh, It's still very early to tell the the situation. Until now, we did not see serious conflicts when it comes to visions on how to run the country because the thorny issues have yet to come. Uh, The peace uh, process has yet to start in full throttle. The real economic reforms, the justice uh, and transitional justice uh, process has yet to start. Uh, So until now, it is holding up but um but the hard work has uh, or the or the very difficult issues have yet to be i would say addressed let's take uh listeners back to the protests that of course toppled bashir so you know yes bashir was indicted as a war criminal and oversaw a regime notorious for slaughtering its own people yet it was the anger over the economy that really toppled him uh, so so what is life like inside sudan life inside sudan under bashir was um very challenging. There was really no freedom of expression, no freedom of the press. Uh, It was a very stifling situation. Uh, The status quo was ongoing for many years. Uh, Civic space was very minimal. It was very difficult to speak up, to say anything, uh, to show any voices of dissent. And at the same time, the economic situation was taking a toll on people. Uh, But uh, the economic situation is related to the conflict. I mean, Bashir's government um, consolidated power by continuing to wage wars on different parts in Sudan. And because they continue to wage wars, they continue to use all of Sudan's resources uh, to invest in this war. So the economy turned into a war economy. Uh, so And this is why people suffered for so long, because nothing was going to social services, nothing was going to actually strengthening the economy, strengthening the different industries that can actually hold up the country. And, and what is the economy like now? After Bashir was toppled, you had a, a long period um, of uh, prolonged standoff uh, between the the protest and opposition on one side and the and the generals on the other. And I assume the economy hasn't gotten any better over the past year. One of the biggest challenges is we don't really have accurate figures. So we don't know how bad things are. But from what we do know is that the economic situation is, the economy is getting worse, actually, uh, because production is very low. Many industries were hit hard. We're still waiting to see the agricultural season and how it would turn out. And, And we see it on the streets. We see that life has uh, is continuing to get more difficult. And this is really the legacy of uh, the mismanagement uh, of the NCP. And this is another reminder that uh, the revolution is not going to uh, really change things in the country and is not going to improve the economic situation, uh, you know, in, in a couple of weeks or even in a couple of years. People were still are still lining up for petroleum. We've had uh, petroleum uh, scarcity over the past few weeks. So you would line up for hours to get gas. Has. But the but the truth is the road to healing Sudan's economy is going to take uh, a very long time because right now there's no economy actually it's it's this is a, an economy based on importing goods and it's an economy based on um, on no production whatsoever. So I think this is this is really key um, because of course it was discontent over the economy which largely sparked the protest and so this is going to be really critical for this new government to find a way to start to right the economy even if there's no there's no easy answers. I'm wondering how the uh, media is is covering uh, this new government domestically. Is it talking about it as one government? I think um, the first thing I want to say is Sudan's media is is, is very 
flawed because Sudan's media is used to idealizing uh, an, uh, the president or the ruler, the leader, and they're used to having a military figure. They're used to idealizing Bashir, which who was a military figure. So right now, you know, Bashir is gone. They automatically went to idealizing uh, Al-Burhan. So right now, the media is not covering it as uh, as as one government. At, uh, they're covering it as two separate governments. Because when you are listening, when I listen to the radio, and usually they start out by saying, Burhan visited this uh, area, he did this and this and this, and then they move over to Hamdok, the prime minister. So it's as if they're two completely different layers of governance. Part of it is because this is how, because the media has a serious capacity issue because it has not been uh, given the freedom to to really properly analyze uh, what's happening in the country and to really critically uh, cover uh, the government. So they're covering it in a very uh, in a way that they just idealize figures, and this is what they're used to. One thing on that, I'm curious: uh, is the media covering also Hemeti, General Hemeti, to a large degree, or has his coverage? sort of diminished now that they form the Sovereign Council chaired by Burhan? I think it has decreased. I mean, and I think it has decreased mainly because Hemeti's media appearances have decreased. He was very visible uh, in April, in May, in June. But I think after a series of events, the massacre on June 3rd, the power sharing deal, the fact that Hemeti had to make uh, some kind of concessions, I think right now, uh, his uh, his approach has changed. Um, he's shying away from the media, I would say, and he's more focused on building his 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 forces internally and consolidating his power than for you know speaking to the public. Okay, and and we'll get back to Hemeti just a second and 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 talk about his rise to to power in, in more in depth. Um, I want to dig into this uh, notion that you know there's sort of two governments that are leading the country at the moment and and talk about each side of this briefly. Um, so on the on the first side, we have Abdullah Hamdok, the new prime minister. Can you just tell us a bit about how he uh, rose to this position? Absolutely. Uh, Abdullah Hamdok was, uh, the, was the candidate of uh, the FCC. He's, he was one of the candidates of the FCC for a very long time. Uh, there were several other candidates, uh, uh, but Abdullah Hamdok was seen as the right uh, person because of his international, you know, uh, presence, because he is known, because he has worked at several high level jobs, and also because he's not in a political party. And uh, many, uh, even within the FCC, saw that the prime minister needs to be someone who does not have, who does not come, uh, who's not part of a political uh, party. Has the Sovereign Council allowed Hamdok to exercise the powers uh, that they agreed to, to let him exercise so far? I want to comment on this by going back to the Constitutional Declaration. So yeah, so in August, the Constitutional Declaration was uh, uh, put forward. Um, it, it became clear that the that we as the public or we as the people outside the FCC and the, and the TMC at the time, we did not have access to the real signed document and that there was another version of the Constitutional Declaration. So um, the version that we had, it, it did show that the prime minister does have some considerable power, but there were some, some words that were used that were a bit tricky, that, for example, the sovereign council has to approve of, the, of his selection of ministers. The, the sovereign council has to approve of different things that the prime minister has to do. And I think this word was very, very critical because it doesn't mean that they have to just approve as in give him the, the, the green light, or does it mean that they have to actually contest and challenge his selection process? So and then so when we came to know that the constitutional declaration that was signed is, is different from the copy that was circulated, and um, it was shocking that the uh, Minister of Justice came forward and said that he, he, he received several copies of the Constitutional Declaration. We were trying to find the original copy. And it became very clear that the Prime Minister does have power, but at the same time, um, there's kind of a clash when it comes to the power of the Sovereign Council and the FCC. And I can, and I also want to speak later on about the the different power dynamics within the sovereign council because it has civilian and it has military members, and and the dynamics are are, are very different w- within the the sovereign council. 
Okay, so so let's let's talk about that. How have you seen the Sovereign Council play out thus far, you know, in that divide between the civilian and the military leadership? I think it'd be good to start off by first talking about who the military leadership in the Sovereign Council is with, why don't we talk about Al-Burhan? Uh, and, then, and then later I'll ask uh, about Hemeti specifically, because I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about with him. So the Sovereign Council uh, is made up of... Um, um, the military members or member, members from military backgrounds. And they're basically, uh, most of them were the were members of the Transitional Military Council. And before that, they were member of Bashir Security Committee. Uh, the civilian uh, members, they were uh, selected based on uh, representation. So they represent different parts of Sudan. Um, so basically, the, the dynamics are very interesting because the civilian members in the sovereign council have not actually made some uh, serious decisions that have impacted uh, the justice file, that have impacted the economic situation, that have impacted uh, the the polarized political uh, situation. And at the same time, we see that the military members of the sovereign council are uh, carrying on with their work. You know, Hemeti is uh, very much uh, visible in trying to dismantle the the old uh, security entity. Uh, he's very much visible in trying to strengthen his forces. Uh, the army is very much visible in trying to uh, consolidate some parts of the eco- economy. So they're trying to replace the NCP in the economic uh, issue, basically. Okay, and then let's talk about Hemeti. Now, Hemeti was the leader of the rapid support forces and still is uh but of course was was more relegated to that role under the bashir regime but but was very instrumental in ousting bashir from power and then and then his forces more or less took control of of khartoum um after bashir fell from power and he's uh found himself now as 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 a as a sort of power broker um how are the sudanese people really viewing hemeti right now and and what do you see as his strategy moving forward? I think Hemeti has, um, he, he gained a lot in April after Bashir's Austin because he marketed himself very effectively as someone who has played a very positive role in the revolution, as someone who has influenced uh, Bashir's uh, Austin, and as someone who has really stood by the, the revolutionaries and supported and protected the revolution. He spoke um, to the people. He speaks in a very simple, humble language. Uh, but uh, but Hemeti, he made a lot of uh, miscalculated decisions. And uh, his involvement in June 3rd, which is very evident, really altered the way people look at him. He was really trying to gain some kind of popular support in Khartoum, uh, specifically, because he did have he did appear to have political ambitions. But his involvement in June 3rd really made people see him as... Uh, someone who is continuing to repeat the same things and the same scenarios he did in Darfur and someone who's trying to bring uh, the Darfur crisis to different parts of Sudan. So right now, uh, he's not seen, uh, he's not viewed uh, very well. He's not, uh, he does not have a popular, uh, I would say, base. He does not have popular support in uh, uh, in Khartoum. But uh, on the other hand, he's continuing to build the RSF. The RSF has a lot of resources. The RS, uh, um, Hemeti is a valuable regional asset. Uh, Hemeti inside Sudan, he controls a lot of markets. He controls uh, much of the gold uh, industry. He controls uh, the cattle, uh, also part of the cattle uh, industry. He has a lot of different different business ventures, building roads, doing different things. So Himeti has a lot of economic assets and he and he is trying to use this economic assets to uh, uh, to basically buy uh, political uh, support. And of course, he has very powerful uh, external backers as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he is definitely uh, still very much involved in the Yemen war. His troops are very much involved. He's been supplying troops to the Yemen war nonstop. And uh, if other conflicts brew in the region, Hemeti is definitely going to be, his help is going to be used. Uh, So besides the Sovereign Council and uh, Hamdok, uh, you also have, you know, the entire apparatus, um, the state bureaucracy that was there under the Bashir regime. Uh, I mean, what's happened to, to all of them? 
many of them are still there. And uh, this is part of the, fr uh, the frustration that has been uh, basically, that has been uh, made very public and made very clear by many of the people, whether it's activists, uh, people who were part of the revolution, and the general public, that the same people who were there mismanaging and, uh, and basically obeying the orders of the NCP or who are themselves part of the NCP, they're still there at the ministerial levels, they're still there in their jobs, they're still there managing companies, managing different government entities, and the Hamdok's government has been very slow in removing them. So I think I think we're <laughs> we're getting here, uh, and we've barely even got started on all the different sort of parties and interests inside Sudan. Uh, this situation's you know incredibly complex, and we're and we're still basically just inside Khartoum um, at the moment. Um, I'm and, and so within within the opposition group specifically, uh, within the 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 Freedom and Change Coalition as they were known. I mean, one of the more fascinating aspects of 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 watching this unfold um, over the summer uh, was the, uh, you know, the, the changing dynamics within the opposition coalition. Of course, we saw very much at first, it was the uh, Sudanese Professionals Association very much led the protests and were very much out in the lead. Um, and then it and then it looks like um, as things have progressed that some of the old opposition elites um, who were the head of political parties, uh, you know, that they've kind of slid back in charge. Um, I'm wondering you know, how you how you see these opposition dynamics uh, uh, working moving forward? Do you, who, who who really seems to be in charge within the opposition or is anyone in charge? Uh, so right now, the opposition has different interests, you know, within the transitional period uh, for for many of them. Yes, the success of the Hamdok uh, uh, government is uh, is essential to basically to to have a democratic uh, process or to have elections in a few years where they can then uh, become part of the process. But at the same time, uh, right now, they're not really working together as a body to ensure that this is happening. Uh, every uh, Each group or each party has their own interest and they have their own uh, agenda that they need to be, uh, th that needs to be served during the transitional um, transitional period. What do you think is the risk that the opposition falls apart in the you know medium term before the elections? I think uh, they would stay together just because just until the election period. But I think the FCC is not going to be there uh, after the after the the elections. But I think it is a risk. And so, in some ways, they might run as separate parties, or or even might assuredly run as separate parties. But they might still maintain this sort of coalition for the, for the transitional period, just to make sure that we actually get to the elections. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think they're definitely not going to uh, run as coalitions, even though this was one of the proposed, uh, I mean, ideas by by uh, you know by some experts who were. Um, who understand that after 30 years of, you know, al-Bashir, 30 years of dictatorship, the political parties are weak and they need a lot of work. Three years is not enough to build a party because you're building a party technically from scratch because they have not had the chance to meet, to grow, to have their general meetings before. So right now, uh, three years is not enough to do this kind of work. So running as individual parties, is it's, it's a very big risk, especially that we do know that the NCP is uh, uh, rearranging itself, they're reorganizing, they're mobilizing, they have the resources, and they have the organization, organizational skills and capacity, and that they could come back as another, as, a, as another party. They're not going to come back as the NCP. They're going to come back as another uh, party. Yeah. So the, <laughs> I, if the if if our listeners are confused at this point with with all the different parties and how complex it is, um, I think you know that's an important an important takeaway on Sudan is just is just you know how fractious this uh, transition could get if some of these broader coalitions uh, fall apart. And of course, you have uh, you know you still have long running wars going on in the country, which we haven't even talked about up to now, um, there's a bit of a precedent uh, in Sudan uh, that's alarming on this case in which you've had twice in Sudan's history a popular uprising 
that toppled a government uh, while the country was within civil war. And both times the new government came in, promised to, to end the wars uh, with its own people and then and then failed to do so. Um, how does it look so far? There's been some movement towards a peace process. It's been one of the things that's been prioritized uh, during even the first six months. And yet there's going to be a lot of difficulties ahead. Uh, do you think uh, Sudan might succeed at this time where it failed? I think it's going to be a very challenging process because at the end of the day, when you look at the government right now, the Hamdok's government or even and, and even the sovereign council, you still see that it's um, elites basically, you know, the, the elites that are the majority of them are not are not part of the, you know, the conflict areas. And the reasons for the conflict is, you know, marginalization, whether it's economic, political mar marginalization, and just uh, the fact that some parts were made very peripheral. If, if the reasons for the wars continue to be there, and if the elites continue to, to, uh, to really marginalize people who have, for a very long time, were marginalized and were really not part of the equation, the conflict is, is going to continue to rage because uh, we have to deal with structural issues uh, when it comes to the governance system and when it comes to the way our economy is structured. Yeah, and just to be clear, it's 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 not just a matter of of a of a class divide, um, although it is also a class divide. You have just entire geographical areas uh, within within Sudan which have been marginalized, which of course is just a recipe for the sort of conflict that we've seen when you have entire uh, regions uh, of a country that that are that have been basically impoverished and 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 cut out of power for for decades. Absolutely. I, I agree with them. Uh, also, as someone from Khartoum and as a woman from Khartoum, I am seeing this because they not only uh, marginalize people who are not from, you know, central and northern Sudan, they also marginalize women. They also marginalize young people. They also marginalize people who have different religious beliefs. Uh, they also marginalize people from different classes because they are more like upper middle class and they have, uh, they have a lot of privilege. And as a result, they have accumulated wealth and status. So I think definitely, and, and, and uh, they're very powerful and they have power and they have access to power and they have uh, the resources that can allow them to, to work, to become politicians, to sustain themselves, you know, in a very difficult economy doing politics. So I've recently uh, met with uh, Abdelaziz Alhilu in Juba, and he's the he's the rebel leader in the Nuba Mountains in South Kordofan. I was asking him about his demands, you know, uh, in, in, in making peace and using this opportunity to make peace. And, you know, one thing he talked about a lot was was the Sudanese identity and about Sudan being open to to non-Muslim, uh, non-Arab identities um, officially as a country, but the you know the other issue he he really he he really pointed at was was his demand for a secular state. Of course, the the Bashir regime was was very much was led by an, an Islamist party, um, and and Abdelaziz was saying uh, his demand for the peace talks is that uh, is that the new government and and the new Sudan, if you will, uh, be be framed as a secular state from the center. I imagine this is, you know, really this is a really complicated issue uh, for the national politics in Khartoum, even among the opposition. I think this is a very difficult stance. This is a conservative society. This is a society that has been socially engineered by the by the Islamic uh, by the Islamic Front for thirty years to act and behave and think a certain way. A society that criminalizes uh, secularism very much. So I think it's a very daring stance and it needs a lot of political will. And I don't think they have the capacity or the will to do that, because to do that, they need to have they need to be willing to impose radical change. And I don't think this system is going to bring radical change. And I mean, it's not going to do that. Now we need to uh, wrap up this this discussion. I think we can talk about uh, Sudan for ages and ages. Um, so I, you know, w one of the topics of conversation uh, that you know that the crisis group is very much uh, involved in with with our interlocutors and very much on the international stage is the question of finding a way to right uh, Sudan's economy, as we talked about at the beginning. Uh, Sudan's economy, you know, continues to, in, in many ways, get worse and worse and worse, uh, despite the political change. Um, you know, one of the topics that 
continually comes up is the American sanctions on the Sudanese economy. I'm wondering how Sudanese people view those sanctions. I think the Sudanese uh, elites or people who are more, you know, I think privileged um, feel that they are affected by the sanctions. You know, they, they feel because, I mean, for, for the larger public, for many years, the NCP has hammered into them that the sanctions are the reason for this tough economic situation. This is what has what they have been told over and over again. But for the the elite and middle class, it's 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 a matter of uh, there's because being under the U.S. sanctions mean that Sudan is not part of the world. We're not part of the financial system. We're not part where we cannot get access to so many different layers of funding and grants as a result. So definitely the U.S. the removal of the U.S. sanctions and for Sudan to be part of the financial system is definitely a very, is something that's very much welcome because it's going to allow, for example, um, you know, civil society to get funding easily. It's going to allow financial transactions. It's going to help stabilize uh, the, the, the currency because then uh, it's you know you can do transfers through the actual official uh, banking system not through the black market and it's going to definitely have so many perks for uh, the the many businesses and many investment uh, opportunities in Sudan so it's definitely definitely welcomed and and what do you think can be done to to bolster the new civilian government um, and and prevent a consolidation of power by Hemeti and some of the the generals who who tried to cling onto power uh, originally. A few things, but like generally, if if the peace process is is reached and there is a fair peace process that is inclusive of everyone, that is inclusive of the people who were displaced, the people who have suffered the brunt of war, and 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 people see that there is actual peace and security, and they feel it in their daily life in the conflict areas. This is going to really support the civilian government. And this is going to make Hamdok's government successful. The second thing is the economic situation. I mean, obviously, this is it's it's uh, the economic the economy needs decades to heal. But um, but like but people need to see changes. They need to see at least uh, the the basic food items stabilizing. They need to see that they you know that there's transportation, fuel is available, bread is available, the basic items are available. Um, they need to see more like, so people need to feel it in their daily lives because right now people, the average person is struggling and, and, and they were patient for a very long time and they supported the revolution, but now they're still struggling and, and they, and this, uh, uh, and this situation needs to be lessened. Their struggles need to be lessened. Uh, so people, so people need to see direct changes, uh, basically, to their daily lives. And um, those are two things that, if done, the economy and the conflict or the peace process, they could really help uh, Hamdok uh, basically become uh, a successful model, and they could really help his government become some kind of like you know successful or at least laying the foundation for the for a democratization process uh, in Sudan. I think that's an excellent note to end on. Uh, Reem, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thank you. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. Thanks for listening. This episode was produced by Mae Francis. 